You know, not every insect in your garden is there to harm your plants. Some of these are beneficial insects, and they fall into three categories. You have your pollinators, you have your predators, and you have your parasites. Pollinators are there to spread, well, pollen. Predators eat the bad bugs, <laughs> love those. And parasites live off the pest bugs. So in a life cycle kind of way, everyone has a job. And when these jobs are done routinely, your garden benefits. So today, I thought we would start with one of the classes of beneficial insects, and that's the pollinators. And the one I wanna start with is one we're all familiar with, is the little honeybee. Honeybees, of course, are one of the best known and most active pollinators around the garden and around the world. You see, these little busy bees increase the overall productivity of a plant through pollination and they are attracted to a variety of plants with many, many flowers. It's probably no surprise to you, but butterflies are also pollinators. Adult butterflies feed on nectar, a point you'll want to consider when selecting plants for your garden. You see, the more nectar a plant produces, the more they attract butterflies. And then there are the hummingbirds, another well-known pollinator. These little acrobats of the sky are drawn to red tubular-shaped flowers that have an abundance of nectar. The biggest threat to pollinators, as you might guess, are us, humans, like me and you. You see, what we do is we unwittingly go along and we disturb their habitat, or we use pesticides that inadvertently kill these beneficial insects. Now, there's some things that we can do to help mitigate that. We can create pollinator gardens. No matter how large or small, you can help by planting things that attract them. Some flowers are more attractive than others. For instance, here we have pansies and violas. Beautiful, yes, but for pollinators, not so good. But tulips, one of the first things a pollinator will go after. You can see some lavender in this bed that we've used, as well as sweet alyssum, and even the blooms of flowering kale. Hey, so whenever you're thinking about growing something in your garden, be mindful of what you choose. Choose things that are both beautiful and good for you, but also good for our little pollinator buddies. To learn more about pollinators, check out the Bloom With Us Pollinator Plants playlist on my YouTube page or log on to firstcommunity.net. Hey, do you want to do your part to increase the number of pollinators in your community? Well, plant a pollinator garden. Now you might be saying, well, Alan, what exactly is a pollinator garden? Well, it's a space that can be virtually any size, but it's packed full of plants, often very beautiful plants, that provide a food source and habitat for a wide range of pollinators. For example, bees are drawn to plants with open or flat tubular flowers with lots of pollen and nectar. The flower's scent can also have a particular appeal to bees, along with the bright colors. Some of my go-to plants for bees are Russian sage and lantana. Now when attracting butterflies, I choose nectar and pollen-rich plants like native wildflowers and old-fashioned varieties of flowering shrubs, like coneflowers or butterfly bush. I also include plants like dill, fennel, and milkweed that butterfly larvae can feed on. And in order to support the high-speed activity of the hummingbird, of which everybody loves, these little acrobats of the sky need to consume large amounts of high-energy nectar. You'll find that hummingbirds are attracted to plants with brightly colored or tubular flowers, such as kufia, this one called vermilionaire, as well as daylilies and salvias. Hummingbirds use their long tongues to sip the nectar found within. You see, the thing to keep in mind is a pollinator garden can be anywhere, like on this busy street, and they can be any size. I mean, here we have about 130 square feet on this busy corner, but they could be as small as a container on your deck or patio. The thing to remember is that all of these underutilized assets around our home, around business, around municipal properties can become places for planting for pollinators. The way I see it, creating pollinator gardens is a win-win. By creating habitat 
and food for our pollinator friends, not only are we helping the ecosystem, but we're also making our communities look beautiful with all of those gorgeous flowers. For a list of plants that pollinators love and to learn more about their habitats, check out the Bloom With Us Pollinator Plants and Habitats playlist on my YouTube channel or log on to firstcommunity.net. Yeah, so what do you think? I'm laying out a little pollinator garden, not a huge area, but I'm arranging the plants in a certain way. There's a process I go through. I really enjoy it. Now, if you're going to create a pollinator garden for yourself, there are five things I'd like for you to consider. Now, first, we need to talk about location. I want you to plant your pollinator garden in a sunny site. Insects need sun's warmth to help them stay active. Now, this can also be half day sun, so I typically like situations where you get morning sun all the way to about full sun till one o'clock that will give you enough sun for these plants to do well. Next, create a shelter from prevailing wind. Now this isn't as complicated as you might think. Use flowering hedges or hedges of native hedgerow shrubs. These will create warm microhabitats within the garden. Hedges are better than fences at protecting gardens from the wind. Third, Group your flowers of the same kind in large drifts. I like to use three, five, and seven plants clustered together. Many insects can only use particular types of flowers. By planting their favorite kinds of flowers together in large groups, you make locating and exploiting that resource much easier for them. And I think for our perspective, aesthetically, it makes it a much more visually compelling composition. Fourth, plant a succession of flowers throughout the whole growing season. This is especially true in areas where you have long growing seasons. Some types of pollinating insects manage to breed two or more generations in a season, but they need pollen or nectar from early spring until autumn in order for this to occur successfully. Finally, but certainly not the least consideration, is to minimize or eliminate the use of pesticides. You hear me say this all the time. You see, if insect pests such as aphids become a problem, there are well-known organic methods to control them. One is just to spray them off with a garden hose. In a nature-friendly garden, such pests are rarely a problem anyway, as they tend to be controlled by birds and other natural predators such as beneficial insects. So how about let's take a look at some of these principles at work. Here in this small bed you can see it's in full sun, right? And it's protected from the wind. We've got this big building here which helps shield from big wafts of wind that will blow the pollinators off course. Secondly, we've grouped the plants together. So there's a lot of one thing in here. You can see the lavenders all grouped together. Also the flowering cabbages and kales. They add beauty, visual impact, but they also attract lots of pollinators. The fourth thing I want you to think about is the succession of bloom. We've got shrubs in here, the way of abelias, which will bloom a little later in the summer. But then we also have the lavender coming on as the alyssum begins to finish up. And this is just the spring expression. Wait till you see what happens in the summer it's really going to be explosive. And the last thing is we're not using any pesticides. We're all organic. And so that makes these little guys a very happy place to live. For a list of plants that pollinators love and to learn more about their habitats, check out the Bloom With Us Pollinator Plants and Habitats playlist on my YouTube channel or log on to firstcommunity.net. So you've planted your pollinator garden. 
That's terrific, and congratulations, and a big thank you for helping support our pollinator population. All right, how about a few tips on how to make that pollinator garden thrive? When the plants thrive, the pollinators thrive. So let's start with watering. When it comes to watering, the key is consistency. You never want flower beds or containers to dry out completely. This can be tough on your plants, particularly the young ones. They rarely recover. One of my favorite ways to water is to use a soaker hose. It deep soaks the ground, which encourages a deep root system and a stronger plant. Then I just put a layer of mulch around them to help hold the moisture in. Now another way to keep your flowers blooming longer is to remove spent blossoms. If this seems like too much work, look for varieties of plants that are self-cleaning, which means the dead blossoms will just fall off on their own. It's also important to remember to feed your plants. That nutrition is what's gonna bring forth all of those beautiful blooms. The better you feed them, the better the soil is, well, the more flower power you're gonna get, and that's gonna make your pollinators very happy. What I like to use is an organic fertilizer, one that um, is a slow release, or you can just apply the fertilizer and dilute amounts on a regular basis. Uh, this granular fertilizer can be applied just twice a year, and it seems to do the trick. What I like about organic fertilizers is they actually help you build the soil. They enhance the microbial activity in the soil, which is really good for your plants. Now, as the season rolls on, you may want to change some of the flowers. For instance, we've already pulled out all the pansies and violas. And while they're not great pollinator plants, they sure make the bed beautiful. But we've replaced them now with these super cows. This is an amazing petunia that'll bloom right up until the first cold nights of fall. And then there are those plants that you don't really want to prune too much. Um, like this one, this is a wonderful little abelia called Kaleidoscope. And look what's happening. It's already starting to bloom. This is what we're after, the flower. Now you can see it has a great coloration to it, hence it's named Kaleidoscope. But it's these little tiny white flowers. I'll pull some of them off. These are the little buds, and this will bloom all summer long. If you take a look at this, you can see, look at the little flower buds here. There's one, two, three, four, five on this little stem. And just since we planted these in early spring, there's already four inches of growth. And this new growth is what supports all the flowers on this abelia. So you don't want to cut any of this back because you'd be cutting off flowers. You cut off flowers, you're cutting off a food source for your pollinators. For more tips on keeping your pollinator garden going strong into the fall, check out the Bloom With Us Pollinator Plants and Habitats playlist on my YouTube channel or log on to firstcommunity.net.